Well, welcome everybody. Happy Friday afternoon. I'm Ray Cody, the president of NJMMA, and welcome to the fifth uh, noon Zoom that we conducted this year. Today, we're privileged to have two great speakers from the Division of Local Government Services to explain the recent local finance notice, which was 2021-11 regarding the federal stimulus funding. Our first presenter will be Jason Martucci. Uh, Jason is the Legislative and Regulatory Affairs Officer for DLGS. He's a licensed attorney in New Jersey certified registered municipal clerk. And he previously served as a councilman in Seaside Park Borough, but then came to a census and decided to join the state government. <laughs> uh, Christine Zapici, um, also well known as Tina, is the Bureau Chief for Financial Regulations at DLGS. And she's a senior member of the DLGS leadership team. And you, your CFO probably knows her well, and your auditor probably knows her well, and you may not know her well. So you'll, this is a good opportunity to, for you to hear uh, from Tina and um, ask your questions. Jason's gonna start out with an overview of the local finance notice, probably for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then we're gonna open the floor to questions for Jason and Tina, and they'll jump in where they feel the, the, who's the most appropriate person to answer that question. You can uh, type your question in, please, if you would. So as we go, feel free to start typing away and we'll start compiling a list of those questions. The uh, presenters will have access to those questions and there we're gonna take all of them and answer hopefully all of them or as many as possible during the time we have allotted, which hopefully it will be a one hour period. Before we start, just one plug on behalf of NJMMA, we have an in-person uh, con conference. We weren't able to have one last year because of the pandemic. So we do have one this September 14th and 15th. It's being run by our vice president, Anthony Ferrara from Hillsboro. It's going to be at the Ocean Place mm -hmm. Resort and Spa in Long Branch, September 14th and 15th. It's a great opportunity to network and reconnect with uh, your fellow professionals. So we hope that you'll register. Registrations are coming in at a pretty good pace. So please register before you get shut out. And in particular, the hotel reservations are going very quickly. Uh, and those you have to make directly with the hotel. So uh, it'd be a nice opportunity to get together and we hope that you can come for that convention. So without going into further, further detail, I'm gonna introduce Jason to kick it off. So Jason, take it away. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me on the line, Ray? Yes, you're very okay. good, yeah. Perfect. Um, thank you. Uh, you, you we greatly appreciate the, Tina and I greatly appreciate the opportunity um, you know, to answer any questions that are, um, that those of the Municipal Manager Association have, uh, participants on the call. Um, you know, again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is a hot topic, as you're aware. And what I'm going to do is give a, give a brief overview of the local finance notice, um, some points, uh, some questions that have come up, and uh, some, some key points. Uh, again, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to answer all, of, all questions today. Uh, to the extent we can't answer a particular question, uh, we'll uh, follow up next week. Uh, we'll, we'll follow up next week with a, re with a response. So, uh, generally speaking, uh, costs incurred on uh, COVID-19 related costs that are eligible under the uh, American Rescue Plan Act's uh, Coronavirus Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, I'll call it LFRF um, for less of a word salad. Um, generally, costs, eligible costs incurred on or after March 3rd, 2021, um, obligated, and they have to be obligated no later than December 21st of, 20, of 2024. Um, these, uh, the, the county or municipality can pass through uh, its funds or portion or all of its funds to authorities, fire districts, boards of education, nonprofits, or individuals. However, the county or municipality will be responsible for, for ensuring any subrecipients adhere to any reporting and other federal requirements. Um, just kind of, uh, there's like four or five uh, main subsets of eligible, uh, eligible uses. Uh, one of them being uh, replacing lost public sector revenue. Um, now the, the formula is, is in the uh, rev our revenue loss calculation worksheet. It's spelled out in the local finance notice, so you could refer to that there. Um, but we do offer an Excel format that it does the calculation, so it doesn't have to be done by, by scratch. So pre, uh, just a point on that, pre-pandemic pre projects uh, or projections rather can't be used as a baseline 
Um, however, you can use the average annual re revenue growth rate in three full fiscal years prior to the public health emergency. Um, now it's measured, it's either that or 4.1%, I believe whichever is greater, I believe. Um, so, and again, that's set forth in the local finance notice and on the, uh, uh, and in the calculation worksheet. So you could refer to that there for more detail. Um, just a couple points on the definition of utility, because I know it's a bit confusing and we, and we did address that in the local finance notice. Um, how, how the federal government, the US Census Bureau define utility is different than how we define utility in the state. Um, we're obviously aware that a utility is pretty much a use that's self-liquidating, such as most commonly a water or sewer utility or combined. Um, you have your beach utilities, marina utilities, golf course utilities, so on and so forth, swimming pool utility. Um, in the uh, treasury rules, the interim final rule says that utility revenue cannot be included in the, re in the revenue loss calculation. But that's the, def the scope of that definition of utility is limited to water, uh, electric, natural gas, and to public mass transit. So anything related to your sewer utility, if it's strictly sewer revenue is permissible as a current charge um, to factor in as revenue loss, parking, uh, lost swimming pool revenue, and so on and so forth, um, so long as you have that baseline to support it. Um, so again, that's just because it says utilities aren't permitted, that's a very limited scope uh, based on a US Census Bureau definition, not, not all the categories we consider as a utility. Um, debt proceeds are to be excluded as revenue, sales of assets are excluded as revenues, but invest, and we had an earlier question on investment income. Loss of income from investments, loss of interest income, uh, for instance, is a permitted is permitted to be included in the revenue loss calculation. So when it talks about sale and investments, think of it as sale of an asset, a one time, uh, one time sale. Um, so investment interest in investment uh, loss investment in income um, again, such as interest, is in, uh, can be included. Um, when you're talking about when to factor in revenue loss. Uh, there's an exception to that rule about costs incurred after, on or after March 3rd, 2021. Um, revenue loss as of December 31st, 2020 can be included. Um, there's four snapshot dates to capture both uh, revenue loss during the height of the pandemic, as well as any lagging indicators. Uh, December 31st, 2020, as we said, to December 31st of 2021, 2022, and the end of 2023. So you, you can continue to take those snapshots of revenue. Um, some may have fully recovered, others might have experienced continued lagging in revenue. Um, and to get to the point, to get to the main point, uh, uh, Ray, you, you mentioned, uh, we received several questions on whether or not, it, there, are, there are certain municipalities that have that have taken COVID uh, deferred charges under the local budget law, under public law 2020 chapter 74 that was enacted last year. Um, one of the provisions of that statute and of the statute that allowed for borrowing, um, uh, basically in a COVID note, um, based on that deferred charge said that you, any federal assistance meant to offset lost revenue had to be used for that purpose. Um, we received, based on the content of the interim treasury rule, as well as continuing guidance that's flowing from that, we've received questions on whether or not the budget law has been, budget law requirement uh, to offset any offset a uh, defer, COVID related deferred charge for lost revenue with any federal assistance has been preempted by the treasury interim rule. Um, we're continuing to look at that and we'll be getting a firm answer to people by next week. Um, so that is, you know, that is something that's under consideration um, and we will be uh, getting, uh, we will be getting a final answer to people by next week on that. So I know that's a question on a lot of people's minds and um, we will be getting a response out to folks. Um, to, get, uh, to get some other of the uh, permitted uses, water, sewer and broadband infrastructure. Um, and this isn't for, 
and I'll get to this prohibited uses in a second, this money can't be used for debt service. Um, now, as far as COVID notes goes, that doesn't apply to that because where it's, whether or not a municipality issued a, a COVID note, any lost, any money for that lost revenue, I know I'm backtracking a little bit, so I apologize for hopping around. Even if a municipality issued a COVID note, they could still use uh, American Rescue Plan fund dollars toward the deferred charge because it's not, we don't consider that as debt service um, interest. Um, so we're considering that as still canceling out the deferred charge or offsetting deferred charge. Um, so under our guidance, as you'll see in the local finance notice, even if you've taken a COVID note, that doesn't prohibit municipalities from, or counties, from offsetting that with uh, American Rescue Plan LFRF funds. However, any interest that was issued, that was done on that, that accrued on that note, it, that can't, American Rescue Plan funds cannot be used to offset the interest. However, it can be used to offset the deferred charge. Now back to the infrastructure portion, the infrastructure, a debt or a principal or interest on debt issued for water sewer broadband infrastructure, uh, ARP funds cannot be used for that. Um, it can be used as PAYGO infrastructure, can, for infrastructure, it can be used as you know, toward a 5% down payment to the extent there's not a waiver already uh, in place. So on that, we talked about obligatory uh, or obligated costs uh, it has to be obligated no later than December 31st, 2024. However, for any infrastructure project, the project has to be completed by December 31st of 2026. So as long as the costs are obligated by no later than the end of 2024, the project can go on for up to two years after that. Um, and also recipients may use LFRF funds to cover costs incurred for eligible projects planned or started prior to March 3rd, 2021, um, provided that the project costs covered by the LFRF funds were incurred after March 3rd, um, that the LFRF funds are being used to offset. Um, with respect to infrastructure, the, uh, the Treasury interim rule encourages strong labor standards and the use of project labor agreements um, offering wages at or above prevailing wage. Um, there's a recent law, Public Law 2021, Chapter 69, uh, anticipate that the division will be issuing guidance that will update our prior gu any prior guidance we've issued um, on project labor agreements. But that law has expanded the use of project labor agreements beyond building construction. For instance, it can now be used for water and wastewater treatment plants. Um, now, as for, you know, I, I saw a question, can you define infrastructure projects under the ARP funds? That's exactly what I was going to get to next. Um, but on the project labor agreements, the still uh, exclusive of land acquisition costs, the projects have to be uh, five, at least 5 million or above. Um, eligible uses, I'll just briefly go over it because it's a non-exclusive list. There is broad, there's broad eligibility under water sewer broadband. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll just give some quick bullet points and you can refer further to the local finance notice and the doc and the treasury documents for more detail. Um, eligible uses of the LFRF funds for water and sewer projects align with the types of categories for projects that are eligible under for financial assistance under the federal EPA's clean water and drinking water state revolving funds. Um, examples include lead service line replacement, water mains, sewer mains, uh, rehabilitation, replacement of water sewer infrastructure, treatment plant facilities, also, also stormwater remediation measures such as impervious pavement, or per, I'm sorry, pervious pavement, um, green streets, uh, measures to uh, reduce the amount of stormwater that goes into uh, waterways or bays and, you know, and so forth. Um, with respect to broadband infrastructure, uh, it needs to be at least, it's target, it has to be targeted toward underserved areas um, where you have upload speeds averaging less than, I believe, 25 megabytes per second. 
um, and upload download speeds of three megabytes per second. Uh, I may be off a little bit on the details, but that's that's also on our local finance notice. You can refer to that there. Um, but again, it has to be underserved area and minimum of the infrastructure, the broadband infrastructure that's in place is a minimum of 100 megabytes per second's upload and download speed, unless there are considerations such as topography that um, make that impractical. Um, there was a law that was enacted in 2007 that people should be mindful of whenever they're looking to do broadband infrastructure. Um, and, and that's further described in the local finance notice. And the gist of it, and you can refer to the law, uh, and there's it's linked to in the web, it's linked on our local finance notice. But really, gist of it is that it has to, a, a broadband project to the extent it fits under that law would have to come before local finance board approval, and among other things, local finance board is looking to whether or not that will that project will ultimately be self-sufficient and won't have to be subsidized by the uh, by the municipality. Um, so. You know, just just going to counsel people to refer to that law. It's fairly straightforward, but you may want to refer. To, but your project, depending on the nature of it, may or may not fall within that. So you may want to consult with your attorney just to, to be on the safe side. But it's not a long law. There's, I'd say, about nine sections, eight or nine sections to it. Um, to the next category of premium pay for essential workers, going on to the next category of eligible costs. Uh, again, there's more detail um, on all these eligible costs in the local finance notice, so I'm, I won't spell it out verbatim. But just to, just a few areas of note: um, any premium pay measures have to; they can go back to the beginning. They can be retro to the beginning of the pandemic. Um, they don't have to be on or after March 3rd, 2021. Um, they must prioritize frontline, lower-paid workers. Um, with regular public interaction or in a janitorial custodian role or san of sanitizing public facilities. Um, examples include bus drivers, um, you know, there'll be public safety, people that are routinely on the street doing interactions. The more time this uh, kind of a general rule, the more time people spend in the office outside of general interaction with the public or customers, uh, the less likely it is to be eligible that for that position to be eligible for premium pay under the treasury interim rule. Um, the mac uh, premium pay is capped at for eligibility purposes under the rule is capped at $13 per hour over and above what the uh, what the employee uh, or subcontractor it is sub subcontracted employees are el also eligible for funds um, for a contracted service um, garbage uh, collection being a you know, prime example that pops in our heads. Um, and an aggregate amount, the aggregate amount not to exceed $25,000 per eligible worker. Uh, and again, it might be, it may be used for retroactive premium pay um, for work done during the pan of the pandemic in 2020. Um, and these could be grants, not just to subcontract money. This isn't just for subcontract employees. It could also be grants to um, eligible workers and businesses within the, the municipality or the county. Um, for how, one, and now the general rule is, in the, in the interim rule, 100, if the pre, amount of premium pay would cause the employee's pay to exceed 150% of the greater of either the state average wage or the county average wage, there has to be a written just the municipality would have to make a written justification in terms of why that you know of the ben, of the benefit of why that is actually needed. Again, the overall aim is to provide assistance to lower um, lower paid employees. Um, and in terms of how how that could be how that information could be found, um, we haven't been able to find any income on. Or I'm sorry official guidance on the treasury side, but we would counsel uh, uh, municipalities to look to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, which does have comprehensive uh, state county um, averages um, for a year and, and by region. So we would, again, US Bureau of Labor Statistics would be the most straightforward uh, reference point for that information. Um, Third category being support, support of public health expenditures. A lot of these 
permissible uses under this category were also permitted under the uh, under the uh, coronavirus recovery uh, fund, the CRF funds, uh, and the local government emergency fund um, that the, the division administered last year. Um, so there is a lot of cross uh, cross eligibility, but but don't forget it's March third on forward. Um, so, and, and again, a number of those eligible uses are spelled out in the local finance notice, um, broad range of public health needs across not only COVID-19 containment, mitigation, testing, vaccine administration, but also the ongoing effects of COVID um, long-term uh, effects. Some people have long, they call long COVID. Um, so to, that means to treat those symptoms and to treat those complications are also permitted. Um, payroll and covered benefit expense. One difference uh, in contrary to uh, the CRF guidelines that were issued last year by tre US Treasury, in order to be eligible for uh, public health, healthcare, human services, public safety and similar employees are also eligible um, under this particular category, but um, they have to be in, again, more of a frontline role. They have to be have spent at least 50% of their time dealing with uh, COVID-19 response. They don't need it to fill out an hourly breakdown of their time, but other evidence such as payroll records, evidence of their role, um, that there should be a justification um, in order to reimburse those expenses. Um, it's not as open-ended, it's not as open-ended of a presumption as it was for uh, under CRF, um, but it is there. Um, so those health public, most straightforward category being public health employees that are uh, administering vaccines. Clearly that would be an eligible use under that category. Um, another broad category being addressing uh, COVID-19 related uh, negative economic impacts. Um, in considering whether a program or service would be eligible under this category, um, the recipient should assess whether and to the extent which there has been an economic harm, uh, such as loss of earnings or revenue uh, that resulted from the co from COVID-19 pandemic and the public health emergency, and whether and to the extent which the use would respond or, uh, or address this harm. Prime example being uh, uh, tourism and hospitality, um, support for small businesses that are involved in that area. Um, the uses that uses that bear no relation or are grossly disproportionate or more attenuated um, to the harm COVID to COVID-19, they're being they're not eligible uses. Um, an example of permitted use would be job training, household economic assistance, loans or you know to affected individuals in a particular sector that was impacted, again, using tourism and hospitality as a prime example. Um, loans or grants to small businesses or nonprofits that were uh, impacted by COVID-19. Uh, and again, economic assistance to industries that were disproportionately active, travel, tourism, and hospitality, again. Um, and another uh, fifth category, and final category, uh, addressing disproportionate public and health, health and economic impacts. Um, you're essentially looking at health and education, means to address health and educational disparities, uh, programs that for public health benefit navigators, um, investments in housing and neighborhoods, housing counseling, um, you know, promoting healthy childhood environments, assistance for you know, promotion of you know, well-being of foster care children, um, after school programs, educational assistance. Um, and this is primarily aimed at uh, those in qualified census tracts, although not necessarily exclusively to the extent that you can identify a uh, disparate group can be identified. Um, but by and large, you're looking at those in qualified census tracts under housing from housing and urban development. Um, and how is that determined? I would, uh, if you go on www.huduser.gov, uh, they have data sets that are that show where the uh, qualified census tracts are, and that's something we'll, you know, we'll follow up and identify that site next week. Um, we, and again, we anticipate there's gonna be a follow-up GovConnect, at least GovConnect guidance uh, on, an, on a few, at least a few issues. Um, and when you look at this tool, you're looking at low-income housing credit, 
tax credit qualified census tracts. And these must have 50%, at least 50% of households with incomes below 60% of the area median gross income, AMGI, or have a poverty rate of at least 25% or more. Um, so that's going to be again set forth in that in those data sets um, for those municipalities with uh, you know, divisions of housing or health, human services, social services. Um, it, you know that information might or it might be or or you might already have that. Um, but for those that don't, you may want to look. You know, we would advise looking to that tool. Um, as for prohibited uses. Uh, debt, again, when we talked about debt principal and interest and COVID, COVID note interest uh, would not be, would not qualify, but, you know, it, it, the deferred charge that would constitute the underlying principle would be a permitted use. Um, but by and large, debt principal and interest, even if it's for, even if it's for water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, that's not permitted under the uh, interim treasury rule. Um, Pure tax offset or to sock away as surplus. Again, that's not permitted. Um, that's not permitted under the Treasury interim rule. Um, when they talk about uh, pension payments being prohibited, um, a pension contribution that goes to, uh, you know, for purposes of PERS or PFRS, that's not permitted. But a payroll contribution, an employee payroll contribution toward pension that is permissible as a payroll expense to the extent it's going toward an eligible use. Um, just a brief note on uh, duplication of benefits. Uh, you know, we counsel and more guidance will be coming on this as well. Um, we encourage municipalities to review the allocation of assistance received through CRF, Coronavirus Relief Fund, FEMA, Small Business Administration, and other state, county, and local programs and any other COVID-19 resource relief uh, to ensure LFRF dollars are not duplicating other means of relief and duplicating um, unmet need. Um, we're counseling, as you've seen the local finance notice, we're counseling uh, municipalities to uh, look to state programs wherever possible, particularly in the areas of public health, uh, small business assistance, housing assistance. Um, we do have that infrastructure uh, to determine you know, determine need on the municipal level. Um, we want to counsel, uh, again, municipalities to look to those areas first uh, as a means to uh, avoid standing up a duplicate program that may uh, constitute a duplication of benefits. We want to avoid clawbacks by U.S. Treasury um, later, a couple years down the line, when their inspector general comes in to inspect how these uses, these uses or these monies were being used. So that's something we want to avoid um, all parties involved. So, you know, call, caution uh, folks on that. And um, we'll also be, and more information will be coming on this. I don't have you know, more detail on this today. We'll also be requiring information from all county and municipal LFRF recipients on programs that are created to determine whether or not there's a duplication of benefits um, that, you know, whether that risk exists between a state and local program and again, more information on that's going to be forthcoming. I'm not going to get too much into reporting because I know I'm almost at a half hour and I want to leave time for questions. But there are, uh, the local finance notice also, also details reporting requirements. Some of them differ between metropolitan cities, um, those that are, are counties and metropolitan cities, those that apply directly uh, to, the, uh, to U.S. Treasury um, for, those, uh, for their dollars and get uh, those dollars directly and those that are not entitlement units that have the, uh, get the distribution of funds through, the, through Office of Management and Budget and State Treasury. Um, those are the non-entitlement units are the municipalities that um, have to certify uh, to the Division of Local Government Services that the, they have the requisite agreement signed and the requisite documentation. The documents themselves don't necessarily have to come to us, but they have to be certified that we have to be satisfied that those documents are in place. So you, because that's a prerequisite for U.S. Treasury, um, you know, to obligate those funds. So once we have that, if there's revenue, if those funds or a portion of all those funds are being used by a municipality for revenue loss or to offset revenue loss, we have to have the revenue loss calculation worksheet that's also linked in our local finance notice and our, on our website. We have to have that as we have to have that individually as well um, 
so we have that for our budget records. Um, so that's that's really all I had. Uh, just to kind of summarize the local finance notice. I know there's a number of questions. Yep. Um, Ray, if I'm missing anything, let me know. I right. have well, why, don't I, why don't I start? Thank you, Jason. Why don't I start? I'll read the question because I don't think our audience, we have 116 participants, aren't getting to see all the questions. So first question is with regards to revenue loss, it says to include it in your 2021 budget on sheet 10. If your budget has already been adopted, how would you add it? So I don't know if that's for Tina or yourself. I would. I can address that. This is okay, Tina. Tina. Um, if your budget's already adopted, your um, the revenue that you're taking into uh, operations for loss of revenue can be done directly through MERNA, miscellaneous revenue not anticipated. You don't do not have to wait until the 2022 budget to recognize uh, those funds. We are we are also directing that those municipalities that are are that are going to take the um, revenue as MERNA for 2021 to still submit the revenue loss calculation to us. Because when we go back and review the budgets next year and we see that item of revenue as MERNA, we're gonna look for that loss of revenue calculation to verify that the amount that you're taking into your operations is appropriate. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we have a question from Paula Cazzarelli. I received CARES Act uh, funding of $1,250,000 for the redeployment of police department personnel, which comprised of 50 to 80% of regular salary. This was based on the U.S. Treasury definition of justification. Can I use this methodology for an ARP reimbursement request? Yeah, I, I think we, we to kind of elaborate on what we, we said before, uh, the answer is generally speaking, yes. Um, so long as, you know, we're talking about redeployment uh, of, of, poli of, public, of police personnel for that purpose, it, you know, again, that's that's standard under the LFRF. If at least fifty percent or more of their time uh, is devoted to uh, is being devoted to the COVID nineteen response, then yes. Um, and again, there doesn't have to be an hourly breakdown. Uh, that, pu that, pu that public safety personnel can fit, you know does fit within the uh, in the definition so long as over fifty percent of their time uh, was dedicated to. Uh, you know, to the COVID response. And Jason, that has to be for costs being being incurred from March 2021 forward. That is correct. Right. Yes. It doesn't go back in time. It's March 20 March 2021 going forward. That's correct. Now the premium pay can go back. Right. Then again, you have to look at the uh, you have to look at the income. Uh, but as to regular as to regular deployed, as for the as for this particular question, the answer is yes. It has to be from March 3rd forward. All right, next question. Can you use funds for lost revenue uh, in a recreation trust account? Yes, to the extent it's tied to, uh, to COVID-19, uh, the extent those re revenue loss can be tied to COVID-19, uh, the answer is yes. Okay, next question. We have a subcontracted garbage collection. The contract expired at a mid-year 2020. The new contract came in much higher and the vendor stated it was due to COVID-related expense. Could any of the funds be used to offset that increase? Um, offs, I mean, I, I, I think, I believe the answer to that could be yes. I'm thinking that, pardon me for thinking that through. I just, I don't want to answer off the top of my head. But I mean, you're dealing with a disproportionate public health impact. If you're dealing, if I don't know if they're paying hazard pay to their employees. Uh, let me just look through my notes here uh, real quick. I just want to make sure I don't. I'm going to double, uh, I'd like to double check that, but I believe the answer is, I believe the answer to that would be, yes, you could probably fit that into public health and economic impacts, but I'm, uh, I'm going to double check and we'll, uh, we'll follow up with a more definite answer. Okay. Well, Jason, you see who submitted that question, so you can contact that person directly. All right, here's Absolutely. a question from Mike Manzella. Would capital investments in public facilities to meet pandemic operational needs include construction or upgrade of emergency response facilities, such as police, fire, and EMS? It, it, it could, yes. I mean, to the extent that it's, to the extent that it's directly, like a ventilation system, for instance. Like if you're upgrading, and we've seen a number of this under CRF funds, where if, if you're doing it, if it's a mean, you have to be careful with this. Um, to the extent it's a means, you know, to directly deal with COVID, you know, mitigating uh, effect of COVID-19, the answer is yes. But to the extent you're looking and we've received a, uh, 
I remember receiving an inquiry on this with related to CRF last year. To the extent that you are, uh, you know, someone wants to add on to their municipal jail, municipal holding cell to facilitate social distancing, that's going to be something more attenuated, and that's going to be outside of the water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure uh, paradigm. So you got to look at the nature of the capital investment and how directly tied it is um, when you're dealing with a capital investment for purposes of, uh, you know, a public health measure. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Marlena Smith, uh, the local finance notice top of page five says references, quote, incorporating local hire provisions. Please explain in greater detail on how to accomplish per the local public contract law, pre-qualification of bidders or some other process. Uh, I think there is probably more in the context of your project labor agreement. Um, I could follow, that's something we could probably follow up in more detail with, uh, we'll talk to our procurement specialist provide a more specific answer. But um, uh, just generally speaking, I know project labor agreements sometimes do have that. Redevelopment agreements, not that they'd be necessarily be covered under this rubric, do have that. They do have local hire provisions. So I'll, uh, to get a more specific answer to you, I'll, you know, I'll circle back. Okay, great. All right, question, another one from Mike Manzella. Would household economic assistance include direct cash payments to impacted households? Yes. That's a yes, that's a fast one. All right. Uh, are COVID-related upgrades to municipal building covered? I'm assuming ventilation or things of that nature. Right, and and kind of just reiterate what was uh, what was said on the last uh, response to the last last question. Capital expense has to be to the extent you could directly tie it, and I, I, we use we keep saying ventilation system because that's something that's probably more the most direct. Um, but the more again, the more attenuated it is, the less likely it is to be a permitted public health infrastructure upgrade. Okay, as to affordable housing use, can that be for the purchase of property to expand a current affordable housing development? Uh, yes, to the extent it's a pay-go and not a, a, you know, not, you know, not a bond issuance, the answer would be yes. Okay, uh, my, this is a longer one. My township will be anticipated as revenue in 2021 municipal budget, the full amount of funds received from the ARP to offset larger revenue losses. A special emergency ordinance was introduced to council to offset a deficit from 2020 financial statement. I wonder, question one, whether the revenue loss should be provided on sheet 10 as per stipulation in the finance notice along with ARP revenues, the larger amount of the two or else. And then there's the second part of the question I think you have in front of you, both of you, whether the revenue loss calculation stipulated in the recent local finance notice is still applicable if the three-year average is being used to anticipate revenue as per local finance notice 2020-24. <laughs> Well, I think I'll, I'll answer the second question, and, and Tina, maybe you could chime in on the first. Yeah. Yes. For um, for the deferred, I mean, maybe on the second too, because but on the deferred charge, to the I know there uh, I'm familiar with there's certain examples where municipalities, uh, in, you know, issued an emergency for a, a certain sum, but it turned out that their revenue loss estimates were that the rev, actual revenue loss was less um, in December 31st, 2020. Um, when they when they measured it, and they ended up canceling a portion of the emergency. And, and Tina can correct me if I, I've misspoken. Um, so I think, be, you know, due to that cancellation, you're you know you're actually getting a, a uh, you're identifying the revenue loss that could be plugged into the uh, or the remaining revenue loss that could be plugged into the uh, calculation that's required under Treasury. So again, that's you know that you take that average three years before the pandemic. You, and then you or 4.1 percent, I believe, whichever is greater. All right, Tina, um, you have anything? Just, yes, yep. let me just yep. um, sure. add to that. Um, people were getting confused with the three-year th the calculation we put out as our requirement for the special emergency is different than the federal government's loss of revenue calculation. Our loss of revenue calculation, the state's loss of revenue calculation, was based purely on specific items. The federal government loss of revenue calculation is a cumul cumulative loss of revenue calculation, and it's gonna calculate a different amount. So when, a, when an amount of revenue is gonna be anticipated in a budget, you have to look at what the federal government loss of revenue calculation calculates. That's gonna give you an amount based on your, your revenues realized at the end of 2020. Okay, but then we are also looking at 
your first tranche. You cannot anticipate more than what your first tranche amount is on the um, the appropriations that are put. We put the amounts on our website as well um, on what you're going to be getting in 2021. That's the only you can only go up to that amount or the amount that's calculated the lesser of that amount or the amount that's calculated on the federal government's loss of revenue calculation as of 1231.20. And as to the question of the deferred charge, whether that has to be used you know, to, to, to pay that down, again, we are waiting for further guidance um, on whether that's gonna be a re requirement for 2021 or after. Okay, thank you. All right, if we don't anticipate our hotel tax receipts and instead receive it as Myrna, can we still recognize that loss? Yes. Thank you, yes. that's a good answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Dina? Any type of, of revenues that you put through Myrna that are applicable, uh, that are losses applicable to COVID, yes, you can you can put it on the federal government's uh, loss of revenue calculation. Okay. Can emergency service equipment be purchased with these funds? It depends on what, how you could fit it in. The, it, 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 is, it depends how connected it is, again, to COVID-19 you know, COVID response. If it's just okay, if someone wants to buy an ambulance, I would I would say no, um, but to the extent you're dealing with um, you know vaccine administration, you know you're buying syringes, um, you know certain you know certain equipment that may be required for you know COVID nineteen testing response. Um, answer answer to that would be, or maybe there's need to be separation, maybe some sort of even tables, anything required to set up a vaccine uh, administration. It, that could be that could be yes, or to the extent that emergency service equipment could fit in under the uh, disparate um, public health or or uh, economic impact category, like in a qualified census tract, you may be able to get that qualified there. But it, again, I would look to what the nature of the emergency service equipment is. Okay, next question. Do we need to do a chapter 159 for the grant and then cut a check to Myrna for the lost revenue or can we code the receipt directly to Myrna not via a uh, chapter 159? Code directly to Myrna. You do not need a chapter 159 for loss of revenue. Okay, thank you. Can the premium pay be given to any employee that worked in the office during the entire time the municipality was closed during the pandemic, regardless of position or salary? Uh, Premium payment. Let me just read that one. Say, can a premium pay can be given? I think that was submitted by a number of administrators. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, no, it, it really depends on their interact degree of interaction with the public, um, and to the great extent that their part, their their role is part of critical infrastructure, and you know, and in COVID nineteen response. Um, so again, they're you know, the extent they're dealing with hazardous substances or just dealing, you know, cleaning up, yes. Um, even if they're not, even if you have a janitor, you know, a janitor that isn't really dealing with the public, they would, yes. Um, to the extent you have someone in the office doesn't really have much interaction with the public, um, the answer would be no. And again, you have to kind of look at what their role is, um, what their exact role is. So yeah, the, I would say, answer that specific question, generally speaking, no, you have to look into the particulars of what they're doing. All right, uh, from Matt von der Hayden, uh, where are we? Okay, are we able to replace water and sewer infrastructure, example, sewer line replacement or pumping stations as part of the ARP funds? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, from Hamanchu down in Old Bridge, please post the Bureau of Labor website link, which we need to verify if employee gross wage will be 150% of the greater of the state or county average annual wage requires specific justification for how it responds to the needs of these workers. Because there's a labor, you'll do that. I mean, whatever information is being requested, if you could send it to me, we'll put it out on the whole uh, NJMMA uh, listserv so everybody will get it. Great. Absolutely. All right, another question. What, just question, I think, what about breathing apparatus? So I, I'm assuming as of whether that's an eligible expenditure. Again, how is it, how tied is it to the COVID-19 response? If it's just breathing apparatus, I mean, if you had to replace it due to you know exposure to COVID-19, I would say yes. But to the extent that it's just, you know, we need to replace our breathing apparatus and it's not, you're not talking about a direct relation to COVID-19, I would say no. 
All right, uh, Mike Rogers from Summit. I'm sure he's uh, uh, has a significant question here. Mr. Martucci, I notice a short-term debt instrument nowhere in the federal regs, guidance, or FAQs as it says it's permissible to use ARP funds for debt instruments if a state statute exists and authorized the debt instrument, that is COVID-19 note for pandemic-related revenue loss. Further, you also opine that municipalities can use AFP funds towards the special emergency notes. Please explain why it is the DLGS position to advise municipalities that must use AFP funds to pay off a debt instrument contrary to the fear, clear federal guidelines on the issue. Because you're offsetting a uh, offsetting a deferred charge that's directly tied to lost revenue. So that it's not like you're paying the principal of a note that's short, short again, short-term debt. Um, that's a general tax anticipation note or something that's being used for to fund infrastructure or some other capital expenditure. So that's that's the rationale that we put forward in the local finance notice. Again, it's because it's tied directly to lost revenue. The reason that the deferred charge was permitted and, and was issued by the municipality was to offset lost revenue. So that's that that is the underlying rationale. But we under we, we understand the concern. That's that's why we put that in the local finance notice and that's why we want to discuss that further here. Okay. So I just following up on that, I, I think there's about, because we've been getting a lot of uh, emails from, I, I think there's about 80 towns took out the COVID emergency. And I guess in a local finance notice, the term that you use is that it should be used, the funds should be used to prepay that, that obligation. So I guess the question is whether that's considered a mandate to do or should is permissive and you can interpret it the way you want to do it. And I guess that may be part of the guidance that's going to follow. Um, and then the other piece of that seems to be, I mean, the, the COVID was supposed to help towns over the rocky road of losing the revenue and the normal debt service for those who took that debt, we didn't in Madison, but for those who did, would be that the debt service would start next year for the next five years. So instead they're being asked to prepay it a year in advance of when it normally was supposed to be started to be paid. So that's some of the emails that are coming in okay. outside of the context of this, but I understand you're gonna issue some guidance, but I hope you'll take into consideration that. And the other one that's popping up is a lot of towns experience huge uh, interest uh, income loss on banking interest based on the pandemic, the banks, the, the rates fell through the floor. And it seems like the federal guidance allows it. The state guidance doesn't allow that to no, recognize it, that. it actually does. And, and it, 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 what we talk about is the sale of investments being in. in a bank interest is okay? Yes. Right, interest is okay. Investments is a, you can use a three-year average for interest on investments. And oh, that's, can, that's helpful. And also for the revenue anticipation for 2021, and you can also include it as one of the revenues uh, under the loss of revenue calculation. You can. You okay. can. Yes, you can. All right, that's good. All right, if the loss of revenue for 2021 is less than the first tranche, do we need a Chapter 159 to accept the excess funds? You, can't, you can only, you know, for loss of revenue, you can only utilize what the uh, federal calculation lets you utilize up to the amount of your first tranche. You're saying it comes, if it comes in less than the first tranche, you can only utilize what the calculation is saying is your loss of, for loss of revenue. Then you could use the balance for something else. Right. But for loss of revenue, you, you can only use for what the calculation says is the loss of revenue for at the end of 2020. Okay. For this budget. But then again, like Jason said, you're allowed to recalculate it at the end of 21, at the end of 22, and at the end of 23. All right, uh, uh, Manchu, can we buy back employee unused vacation time carried over from 2020? Uh, I would say not. Uh, there's really no authority in the in reviewing the interim rule. There's nothing really, it just, it just generally speaking, unless there's some sort of nuance there, um, we can go further and we could deal with that individually. Um, generally, as a general matter, no. Okay. Can we claim additional cleaning requirements contracted due to COVID? Uh, yes, we're dealing with public added public health expenditure, yes. Okay. Software upgrades to allow for digital submission of building department applications and online review expenses. Is that considered because uh, buildings were closed and staff was not in the building? That's a very good question um, because the interim rule does, and, and the guidance to for the frequently asked questions, the fact sheet talks about. Um, you know, using the money for technological infrastructure improvements. However, it, it has to be it has to be tied to improvements. Uh, you know, public health, dealing like in other words, contact tracing or 
you know, tracking post-COVID symptoms. So improve, generally speaking, improvement of public health infrastructure, yes. Um, to the extent that the municip, I would say the answer to this question is no, unless you could tie it um, to a disparate, like if you're looking to improve economic development in an area where the whole municipality is in a qualified census tract, you might be able to do that, or you might be able to give that argument there. Although you may want to select a more straightforward means of, uh, you know, assigning those costs. But as a just as a general, uh, just general again, not going into nuance, I would say no. No. Okay. When will we receive notice as to the exact amount we will receive, and when we will receive the funding? Uh, this, uh, Deborah, is this is this for non entitlement units? Because the uh, the exact amounts are available, or we link to that on a local finance notice. Um, for the non entitlement community, for, for all for everybody. metropolitan okay. county and for yeah. non entitlement units. For everybody. Yes, for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right, there's separate links, but you could find them. Uh, you could access them in our on the local finance notice on our website. Um, so you'll be as for when, if assuming, Deborah, you're in a municipality, it's in a non entitlement unit. When we receive the, uh, you know, the certification form, you know, that all documents are in place, um, then we send that off to state treasury. And there's, there's usually, you know, we send once a week, a batch once a week over to treasury of the, uh, of the towns that are non-entitlement units that are slated to be available reimbur reimbursed. Um, so that's from that point, it's usually a week turnaround time. To when the funds are, are dispersed to the uh, to the local unit. Okay. All right. Can you give money directly to a fire department or rescue squad to assist them with vehicle repairs for aging vehicles? Generally speaking, no. Um, you got there has to be it has to be related to COVID COVID nineteen unless you could find some sort of other hook like and this could be very tricky like. Under maybe somewhere under some sort of economic, uh, economically disadvantaged, qualified census tract, maybe, but I even think that's questionable. So I think the as a, in general, the answer to that would be no. Okay, I may have missed this, but can these funds be used for stormwater infrastructure projects? Someone Absolutely, they can. Yes. yes, can the can the monies be used for cybersecurity related costs? Again, um, and, and the answer to, it depends. Um, it depends on, and I'd like to kind of expand on what I mentioned earlier with respect to technolo technological infrastructure improvements for public health related technology systems. Uh, it could also be used for improving, particularly in the uh, area of, you know, disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged areas, qualified census tract, improving social you know, systems related to delivering social services, um, and that would include, you know, cybersecurity, you know, systems related to job counseling, systems related to outreach, homelessness. Um, and it, don't forget, it could be at targeted populations, even if there's not a, even if a municipality or a portion of a municipality is not any qualified census tract, the extent a population that's been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, to the extent you could identify that population, um, they would fit um, measures to assist that population would fit under that rubric as well. Okay, next question. How do we know that you received our request and all documents? Um, there, I don't know the answer to that question. I believe there's some sort of confirmation that comes in to the extent there's not, I'd have to, I'd have to check back. And I'm assuming this is for a non-entitlement unit. Uh, mo mo yeah, there's very, yes, I'd say the overwhelming majority is non-entitlement. Okay, this call. I'd, have right. to, I'd have to double check into that. All right, can we use the funds for revenue shortfall in a pool utility since membership was down by 80%? Yes, there, it's, there's a presumption of pretty much all revenue loss that it was due to COVID-19, and you could definitely say that in the case of swimming pool. So the answer is yes. If using ARP funds for a new water sewer utility capital ordinance for infrastructure, can we deposit the funds in the water sewer utility capital fund as reserve for sewer rehab and then appropriate that reserve as a funding source of the capital ordinance? Yes, you're not socking it away in reserve. You're actually using it for the project. Yes. All right. Do non-entitled communities have just have to sign the assurance of compliance with civil rights requirements form? Where is this form submitted? 
Um, they have to, any use have to assign, have to execute all the documents that are uh, required in the checklist. Um, what the assurances of compliance civil rights is one of them. Uh, another one being uh, terms and conditions of the award, uh, award terms and conditions for non-entitlement units. That also has to be signed as well. The form doesn't have to be submitted to the state. Um, I believe that's kept on file or submitted at some point with US Treasury, but I'd have to follow up. Uh, I have to, I'll have to. i follow up on that to, uh, to see. It might just have to be kept on file, but to the extent it has to be filed with US Treasury, I have to follow up on that. Okay. And last question, I got knocked out here, but can you see the last question, uh, Jason? Yes, as we, I'll read it, as we obligate the funds toward qualified uses and the timeline, ex, I believe that's expires, is the state government and or federal government requiring us to submit proof and will this all be audited similar to FEMA matters? Uh, yes, they, they, it's a federal, uh, as I said before, there's a federal reporting requirement, and that's uh, related in more detail in the local finance notice. Um, the frequently asked questions have a further update, I believe, recently on that. Uh, and just so everyone knows, the frequently answered, frequently asked questions, uh, which are linked to our uh, linked in our local finance notice, they're updated weekly. So I strongly suggest, and and those updates are delineated by date, so you don't have to search the whole document. The the, the sections that are updated are identified. So by the date in which they're updated. So I strongly uh, counsel uh, you know, those that are on, the, on this uh, Zoom call to uh, look at that document weekly. It may answer some questions that are, that are coming up that weren't originally. Um, but yes, there's a reporting requirement. And yes, the, you know, those documents have to be filed and submitted as required. There will be further guidance coming from the US Treasury on that. Um, there's also the duplication of benefits analysis that, you know, more information on that, again, will be forthcoming. All right. Thank you. I just would I like to add, go ahead, Tana. Ray, I would just like to add something on that previous question about sure. certifications. I believe this, in order for the NEU to get paid, we're kind of acting as the uh, go between between um, the municipalities and tre state treasury. So, those certification documents should be sent to the LFRF mailbox. I don't think this was made clear in the LFM and we should, because I'm getting a lot of calls on that. Um, the LF, LFRF at dca.nj.gov mailbox was, was set up to, sub, to receive these certification documents. Um, and I believe they all have to go there. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And uh, I think that concludes our- uh, There is one more question. One more? I'll take the last one. This will be our last question because we okay. want to kind of keep to the hour. Um, when is the deadline to submit documents? Oh, there's actually two. When is the doc deadline to submit documents? Um, as soon as possible. The sooner we get them, the sooner we can turn around and, uh, you know, and, get the, and get the money out to folks. Um, Steve McDermott, uh, is there a provision to account for revenue loss using alternate years if a municipality with a swimming pool was closed for reconstruction in 2019, um, was ready to open for 2020, but had COVID revenue loss in 2020, perhaps using 2018, 17, or 16 instead? Uh, the answer to that would be no. Again, pre-pandemic projections of what revenue would be, uh, it would have would have been, but for the reconstruction 2019, can't be used. Um, you'd have to uh, you have to go by, you know, the 2019 budget um, as the uh, as the baseline. In other right. words, we can't change the base year. That's that's per the federal government guidelines. Correct, correct Jason. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. All right. Thank you all. I'd like to thank our speakers, Tina and Jason. Thank you so much. It was really informative. Um, Thank you. For the members who are participating, we have uh, right now 106. Thank you for uh, staying on and your uh, good questions. CEUs have been requested for this session from DCA, and there's no way we're not going to get them with this panel. <laughs> so, uh, it's currently pending. The, uh, the regular person, Shannon, is out on maternity leave, so it may take a couple days or so to get it, but we'll send them out separately to those who are registered here. Um, I'd like to thank Michael Plessier, who's been our Zoom master for this, uh, who works in Madison, does a great job for us. 
And lastly, I'd like to close again, plugging our conference, September 14th, 15th, in person, Ocean Place Resort and Spa on the ocean in Long Branch. Just come meet your professionals, get the network again. Good panelists such as this caliber speaker will be uh, multiple sessions about that. And it's a good way uh, to get out of the office and get some work done and meet some people and uh, find out what's going on. So thanks so much, everybody, for participating. And we'll see you on the next noon Zoom. Thank thanks you. Again, Jason and Tina. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everyone.